Hey everybody, welcome to Word Balloon. Welcome to fall. John Suntress here. A couple show notes before we get started. Commercials can be annoying. I get it. Uh, commercials, they'll pay the bills and uh, really help me fund Word Balloon. And uh, it's a free way for you to help me with Word Balloon without having to spend a dime or do anything but just being patient and going through those commercials that start up at the beginning of the show before we get into the meat of it. It really means a lot, so please do that. I have a YouTube channel, at Word Balloon under the name Word Balloon, and I'm at 800 subscribers. I'm trying to get to at least 1,000. Again, another free way you can support Word Balloon, uh, and it's uh, video content there, that, and plus episodes of the show, and I intend to do a lot more video content in the weeks and months ahead. So thank you for your support. The best way to reach me, if you've got questions about the show, whatever, email john at wordballoon.com, please. Better than Twitter, better than Facebook messages. It would really mean a lot. One more commercial, and then we're going to start. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Word Balloon, the comic book conversation show. John Suntress here. Sorry it's been more than a week since I had a new show. It's been an interesting two weeks. I went out to Road City in Portland. I uh, went a couple days earlier, saw my friends, including Brian Bendis and Kelly Sue DeConnick and Matt Fraction and Greg Rucka and Jen Van Meter and Ibrahim Mustafa and Jeff Parker and Diana Schutz. Uh, and, and Word Balloon listeners at Rose City, thank you so much for saying hello. Uh, really had a great time. On uh, Saturday of the convention, lost my wallet, so I kind of blew it that day as far as the con goes. Sunday I did show up for a little bit, and then I took the red eye back. Never found my wallet, so I had to travel without ID. That was a very interesting uh, TSA experience at the airport. But they helped. I made it back to Chicago. And then, uh, you know, I took the red eye. So I pretty much slept all day Mondays. Tuesday, got the flu. Spent the entire week with the flu. And it really knocked me out. I mean, I, I honestly spent the week in bed. I am much better now. And I'm making up for lost time with a couple episodes that I intended to put out last week. Uh, one of which would have been for Batman Day. This episode you're listening to now. It occurred to me that uh, as uh, we're getting closer to Batman Catwoman, Batcat, as uh, Tom King calls it. And uh, back to the romance, and the romance is back in full swing again in City of Bane as uh, Tom's Batman run marches to a a close this year and then uh, continues over in Batman Catwoman. I am interested to uh, see where the story goes, but I'm thrilled that a Batman romance is on the uh, front uh, burner again as far as Batman stories go. And some people are like, why did you decide to make Batman a, a romance comic? Uh, I don't understand. I saw a couple people write down that, and I've seen that before as well. Not the first guy to do it. Lots of great creators have leaned on Batman's relationship to tell stories. Uh, one story in particular, a classic from the 70s, was uh, called The Laughing Fish. It was also rebranded as Dark Detective. Uh, an incredible combination of creators. Marshall Rogers and Terry Austin on art, and the great Steve Englehart, the great Steve Englehart, pardon me, doing the writing. It's it's one of the best Batman stories. Silver Saint Cloud, the love interest. Um, they adapted the story for the Batman animated series, of course. Before that, hey, Batman '89, of course, celebrating its uh, 30th anniversary this year. Uh, in a lot of ways, uh, that relationship between Vicky Vale and, and Bruce. Um, actually, Silver St. Cloud. I mean, God, even Kim Basinger looks like Silver St. Cloud. Doesn't really... Vic and Dale was redhead in the comics back in the 50s. Um, and they called her Vicky Vale. But it was Steve's story, as far as the romance goes, pretty much. And, um, you know, uh, uh, she didn't she didn't need uh, Alfred letting her into the Batcave, but Silver knew uh, Bruce's identity as well. And it was a pretty haunting story. Well, in the early 2000s, the team got back together again, Rogers, Austin, and Englehart, for Dark Detective 2. And in a lot of ways, Dark Detective 2 resembled the Dark Knight movie, which is pretty interesting. And frankly, I don't know if he ever got checks for it or not, but I always felt Steve Englehart got a pretty raw deal as far as an acknowledgement from the filmmakers. Uh, No disrespect to Sam Hamm, who wrote the wonderful script for Tim Burton's 89 Batman movie. But, uh, I mean, it uh, again, I, I think it owed a lot to that uh, relationship that Steve established in Dark Detective 1. We talk about that in this conversation. It's a conversation from uh, a few years ago, back in the Word Balloon archives. But like I said, when I was reading this, Tom King kind of, Why, why'd you do that? I don't know. Um, the majority of uh, Batman readers, as we all know, they pretty much love the Batman-Catwoman romance. 
they were very much in for uh, the bad wedding that uh, got uh, rudely interrupted. Um, it's interesting to see that uh, back when Dark Detective 2 came out, I don't think that uh, Steve got the same reception. I think he got those same questions that Tom is uh, getting from some sides now. And uh, it's ridiculous because we all know the best comic book stories can adapt any sort of genre, whether it's adventure or a spy story or romance or a comedy. And uh, as I was just telling uh, somebody online, um, even uh, my buddy Mike Cronenberg, who was kind of complaining about Batman 66, the Adam West TV show. And I'm like, you know, to me, that's kind of the fourth uh, runner of things like Deadpool, believe it or not. And not from an edgy standpoint, but just in terms of being a comedy. Ant-Man as well. You can do anything with a superhero story. And I think Steve Vinglehart proved that with his times that he was writing uh, Batman. So I hope you enjoy this uh, story from uh, uh, several years ago on Word Balloon. Me talking to Steve Vinglehart about his great run on Batman on today's Word Balloon. Now it's brought to you by the League of Word Balloon listeners. Thank you greatly, League, for your support. We're winding up September. I got to meet a lot of you at Rose City. I got to meet a lot of you the previous month at Terrificon. Um, thank you, as always, for your support. Sponsoring Word Balloon is uh, helping me out. It's showing me that you really like the show and uh, you like what I do here. I do my best. I try to give you uh, a ton of entertainment every month here at Word Balloon, talking to great creators about their stories, about pop culture in general. And uh, you make it easier by uh, helping me out by sponsoring Word Balloon through your subscription via Patreon. Word Balloon is free. It'll always be free. But if you like Word Balloon, you want to help out the cause, go to patreon.com slash Word Balloon, or you can click on the Patreon ad on the front page of wordballoon.com. Thank you greatly for your support, League of Word Balloon listeners. Word Balloon is also brought to you by Aftershock Comics, uh, one of the great uh, comic book companies in America that continues to prove itself. They had a great Rose City. I I got to see some uh, great Aftershock creators as well. And uh, hey, you know, join the readership. Check out some great stuff from uh, people like Marguerite Bennett, who I saw at Rose City, and Donnie Cates, who I saw at Terrificon, and uh, my buddy Phil Hester, my buddy Tim Seeley. We'll be talking to Tim in a few days. He's got some new stories along the way. Uh, I continue to uh, hound uh, Steve to uh, hook me up with Joe Pruitt, who I haven't seen in years and haven't talked to in years, but really want to talk to about his horror anthology, Shock. Uh, There's Matthew Clickstein's You Are Obsolete, other great new books on the way from uh, great Aftershock creators to go alongside things like Marguerite Bennett's Animosity and Donny Cates' Baby Teeth and all the great work that Garth Ennis continues to do for Aftershock, including the wonderful Jimmy's Bastards, Phil Hester's Stronghold, Tim Seeley's Dark Red, Colin Bunn doing tremendous stories between Dark Ark and Brothers Dracool and uh, Night Temporal. Uh, Lots of really neat stuff. And uh, more conversations with more Aftershock creators coming in the days and weeks ahead. But uh, head over to their website, check out their inventory. You will find full story descriptions, preview pages, and the diamond codes on how to order these books through your local shop at AfterShockComics.com. All right, before we get into our Steve uh, Englehart conversation, I saw Ad Astra this weekend. I treated myself after being sick so long. I'm like, all right, I need, I need some entertainment. And I'm also going to check out Downton Abbey, uh, both for myself and also my uh, buddy Sandy Max, who is doing a great new Downton Abbey uh, movie uh, podcast and going back to do a television rewatch of the series, Downton Blabby. Go check that out on iTunes and uh, enjoy Sandy. She's a great host. We've worked together in Chicago radio for years. She's now part of the Milwaukee broadcast scene. She is their PBS arts rep and uh, is a massive uh, Anglophile and takes uh, tons of uh, junkets out to England to do interviews. She's interviewed John Cleese of Monty Python. She's interviewed some of my favorite British comedians, like members of the Young Ones cast, for that great show from the 80s. Um, she went out and did a lot of uh, Downton Abbey tours of the actual mansion that's used, has met uh, actors and people behind the scenes, and all that is featured in her Downton Blabby podcast. But I know you just heard me say, hey, John, you, you mentioned Ad Astra. You haven't even talked about it. Spoiler-free review? Excellent. Excellent. Fantastic. If you've seen the trailers and you see guy, you know, astronauts in moon buggies, 
uh, shooting laser guns at each other. Are you kidding me? You had me at hello. And, um, I mean, my God, I'm such a NASA fan, and especially classic NASA, uh, the Apollo missions, the pre-space shuttle missions in particular, from Mercury through Apollo. Uh, I love it. And it it really evokes that. It is like the Martian 10 minutes from now in terms of extrapolating future technology, but uh, it's still very grounded and very recognizable uh, as uh, very modern human stories. Uh, everybody's excellent in it. Donald Sutherland, Tommy Lee Jones, of course, Brad Pitt. Come on. I, I, don't you think it's Brad Pitt's Oscar year? I mean, really, they should just give it to him right now and be done with it between this and Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. But I will be talking to um, a couple other friends that are certainly in the vein of loving Ad Astra, I'm sure. And we'll uh, we'll give you some spoiler-heavy conversation about it on Word Balloon in the days ahead. I mean, I've already, like, soon, as soon as I saw the movie, I'm out, like, emailing and private messaging friends and going, okay, you got to come on because I know you're going to love this too. Uh, it's excellent, man. I, I just can't rave enough about it. And I'll, I'll talk more in detail about it on, uh, on an Ad Astra review episode of Word Balloon. But in the meantime, uh, let's uh, really get things grounded and uh, go back to Gotham. And uh, the usual uh, dynamics between uh, another another movie that's coming up in just a couple of weeks, of course, Joker in uh, October. But uh, right now, let's uh, think about Joker and Batman and Silver St. Cloud and the Laughing Fish story, otherwise known as Dark Detective. Uh, the first story and Dark Detective 2 from its author, Steve Englehart. This is a conversation that I had with Steve about 11 years ago, maybe 12 years ago. And I hope you enjoy it. But uh, in, in, in honor of Batman Day, a conversation with Steve Englehart on Word Balloon. Welcome back to Word Balloon, the comics conversation show. This is John Suntress. For over 30 years, writer Steve Englehart has been creating adventure fiction with deep characterization and strong themes that have served as the foundation for new interpretations of classic characters like Captain America, the Avengers, and the Justice League. In the late 70s, Steve teamed up with artists Marshall Rogers and Terry Austin on a seminal run in Detective Comics, featuring Batman, the Joker, and one of the classic Batman love interests, Silver St. Cloud. The run has been reprinted several times, and now the team of Englehart, Rogers, and Austin have come back with a continuation of their Batman story, Dark Detective. Joey Cavalieri, the editor at DC, um, I think DC wanted to do a number of Bat projects to sort of flank the movie release, and I guess Joey came up with the idea of putting us back together to do this thing. Well, I like the fact that uh, the tone of your Batman specifically has stayed the same, because certainly in this post-Frank Miller era, we've got a grimmer, you know, angrier Batman that's a little more self-motivated, and, and it kind of loses some of Bruce Wayne, and we've got a very human Bruce Wayne story going along with the action in facing all these villains. Well, I think that's essential. I mean, in any care, in any strip, I think the human side of it is important. That's me. You know, I mean, you know, that's I've always thought that that uh, I want to know who the person is who's wearing the costume, in addition to the cool part with the costume. And and um, you know, the two things that I did when I when I took over the Batman in the first place was to really do the Bruce Wayne, really look at Bruce Wayne uh, by way of Silver Saint Cloud as his girlfriend. And then conversely, um, really do the Batman as much more of a pulp hero, a, you know, a more dead of night under a full moon fighting a maniac in a rainstorm kind of thing than had been done before. And, you know, and that applied to the Joker as well. I mean, to make the Joker uh, the, you know, the, the more pulp murderer that he had been as opposed to the the clown prince of comedy that he had become. So I kind of took it and made Batman more Batman and Bruce Wayne more Bruce Wayne. The interesting thing now is that, uh, um, well, there were two, you know, it's all sort of part and parcel, but your reaction has been a common reaction. A lot of people um, have written in to me and to D.C. and said, A, we really like what you're doing, and B, we really don't like... (laughs) You know the other one, the one that the one that the books are are generally propounding. So DC has just um, switched uh, editors on the books, and the new guy is going to is going to take it in a, in our direction, basically bring back Bruce Wayne, bring back Commissioner Gordon, do more really? human interest stuff. So that you know the uh, Frank Miller created a wonderful 
thing, but the specific thing about it was that was Batman at the end of his career, after he'd seen it all, done it all, and was reasonably burnt out. And the idea of trying to transfer that to the contemporane- contemporaneous Batman, the ongoing Batman, mm-hmm. d- does not seem to have been a success, you know? Well, it's, so. been, a, it's been an interesting 20-year experiment, I guess. Uh-huh. But, uh huh. And, and honestly, I like all uh, forms of Batman. I think there's obviously as much validity to the Adam West Batman, the Dick Sprang, Jerry Robinson, Bob Kane Studio Batman, the Bill Finger Batman, your Batman, Frank's Batman, everybody. Denny O'Neill, of course, Greg Rucka. So it's, you know... There are there's too many continuity hounds, and and I'm glad to see that different interpretations of Batman beyond Elseworld stories, which of course you did your share of those as well, but that that we're seeing a lot of different facets of Batman, and yeah, I I, I like this, and I like I like Dark Detective because in a lot of ways it's a Batman romance story. Yeah, it is. Uh, issue number three, particularly, we were calling between ourselves the Batman romance book, and and. Uh, um, the first run was eight issues long, and this one was only six issues long. The total page count's pretty much the same because the stories are longer now. Okay. But there is a difference when you've got eight breakpoints as opposed to six. Things have to move quicker, um, you know, in a six-issue thing. Even though you've got the same number of page counts, you, you're, you only have six climaxes as opposed to eight and so on and so forth. And, and um, if I'd had, you know, another couple of issues... I would have been able to stretch the romance. I would have been able to stretch everything a little bit more. Mm-hmm. As it happened, um, you know, I specifically did not want to undo what I had done with Silver the first time. I didn't, you know, it had to start off with them definitely broken up, but then I had to get them back together. I had to get them deeply in love, and then I had to work on from there and all that in six issues. So um, things, uh, they moved at a faster pace this time uh but by the third issue yeah we were definitely that was definitely the romance issue and you had experience of course back in the in the 70s and early in your career in doing some of the old romance comics of of the 70s am i correct well yeah i just did a couple when i was first breaking in marvel in those days published a lot of books and in addition to all the you know all the superhero stuff they Mm -hmm. still had westerns and they still had romance and they still you know they were doing some horror books and so forth it was a place where new writers could you know they could try you out they could try you out on the sort of second and even third string stuff where if you failed nobody would particularly notice but if you but if you did okay then you could work your way up like triple a ball or whatever and uh, (laughs) uh... yeah so i i wrote a couple of romances i drew a couple of romances uh... it was never never a genre that I was deeply in love with, but I was happy to do it at the time in order to have something to do. And certainly, I mean, as I say, I wasn't particularly taken by romance books, but I do think that the human element is important in everything that I do, and and romance is certainly a part of, you know, the human condition. So I'll generally end up with some sort of love situation somewhere in these superhero books. And Silver St. Cloud, of course, is the one woman that got away. I mean, there, you know, it seems like even, you know, Vicki Vale, Julie Madison, you go back to, you know, the 40s and stuff, there have been girlfriends, Kathy Kane, that have kind of come in and out of Batman's life. But, you know, Silver State Clown, for those eight issues, obviously made a huge impact on the audience. Yeah, well, that was the thing. I mean, again, there had been, as I say, I went back to the original Batman, what you called the, the Bob Kane studio and, and Jerry Robinson and Bill Finger, those guys, mm-hmm. uh, to try to get a sense of the Batman. And, but, and he had Julie Madison, I guess, was his girlfriend then. But I mean, she, girlfriends from then all the way through had basically been sort of arm candy. I mean, yes. they'd show up long enough for Bruce to say, yeah, this is my girlfriend, therefore I'm a playboy. But nothing, you know, nothing ever really happened. There was never any depth to any of that. And I really, you know, I mean, I really thought if I was going to do Batman the way I wanted to do it, I wanted to know who this guy was inside the mask, and the best way to do that was to give him this kind of um, classic romance story. Um, it's It sounds sort of odd. I mean, it's it's worked now, so, you know, it doesn't sound so odd. But um, one of the things that, that uh, we were all debating as we did this, um, in somewhere along the line, um, actually in the sixth issue, but I'm not going to give anything away no problem. about it. But um, Bruce has a chance to talk to Silver, but he's wearing the Bat costume at the time. And 
um, I really wanted him to say something endearing to her, and and I went through this whole thing. Can the Batman actually say the word honey? You know, <laughs> it's like you can't you can't really imagine Batman saying the word honey, and and yet you know he is in love with her, and so on and so forth. Uh, but I eventually settled for just using her name. You know, I couldn't. The term of endearment coming out of of a, the Batman's mouth never made any. It just didn't sound right. You found the line. Well, yeah, you know, but I mean, the point is that um, so doing a, a romance with Batman isn't the isn't the first thing that comes to anybody's mind, but uh, uh, you do have to kind of find that line because again, you know, he is the Batman. I mean, you can't just go, oh man, I'm going to turn him into a romantic hero and then forget, you know, all the other parts of him. Mm -hmm. That is that is the trick, yeah, to find that line. And you're also able to point out that it, it is, you know, what Batman was that kind of drove Silver away in the first place, too. Yeah. Well, I mean, that gets back to pointing out exactly who he is. I mean, it, it, that's what I want. Who Who is this guy? Uh, not what is his power, not what does his costume look like. Who is he? Because I'm, you know, I, I wanted to be an artist when I started out. That's what I wanted to do. That's what I tried to do. In the end, I decided that, uh, you know, I could see it in my head, but I couldn't get it out of my hand the way I wanted, but I could get it out of my mouth the way I wanted, so I became a writer. Um, I love I love comic book art. I love what it can do, and I love storytelling and all that kind of stuff, but I'm not an artist, so I'm going to be thinking more about the character rather than, you know, what he looks like. Is uh, I, I remember that... Uh... They reprinted in the 80s the original eight issue run as Shadow of the Batman, right. and, and then uh, it did come out in trade. Is the trade uh, back in uh, print again? I don't know if it's in print. It seems to be readily available, so it probably is. And I would imagine when they do trade Dark Detective, they'll bring back the original story too. That's what they've said. Yeah, that they would bring them back as two. And, and in fact, since they do have pretty much the same page count, they'll look pretty nice sitting next to each other. You know, as Dark Detective One and Dark Detective Two. I consider the first, the 70s run now is Dark Detective 1. I was talking about this with a retailer the other day who said, well, uh, nobody nobody will get that, you know, because it hasn't been called Dark Detective before, but hopefully when it comes out in trades, people will start to get that. We always called it, I remember the Laughing Fish story, of course, yeah, you know, tying yeah. it to what the Joker was doing. And again, as you did, uh, you, you reach back to what the Joker originally was. You go back to that first Batman story where the Joker appears, and that is the Joker. Yeah, that's the guy I wanted. And and um, if you read the early, you know, like the first year of it, mm -hmm. they did a nice thing um, where every story ended with the Joker uh, usually dying, uh, but yes. sometimes going to jail. But in any event, the next Joker story would always begin with how he got out of that, uh -huh. you know, how he survived, how he broke jail. Um, and I, in fact... Um, Again, I'm not going to give anything away, but but when this series ends, I've got the Joker in a situation where I know how how he would escape it if he you know if he was going to. I think if we do any more uh, Batman, the Joker won't be in the next run. So, but uh, I, you know, I thought it was important to kind of touch base with that kind of stuff. Um, they had a you know they had a wonderful concept. Uh, I've I've been fortunate enough to meet Jerry Robinson. I met him in New York a month ago, and I was just in San Diego, and he was down there. And, mm -hmm. and um, you know, he and I have, you know, talked at both occasions. And, um, you know, he said that, that after a while they thought that um, in order to broaden the audience, they needed to kind of back off from the pulp stuff. And that's when they introduced Robin, and that's when they, you know, made Batman a little less of a creature of the night and a little more of a of a hero. Mm -hmm. um, uh, which uh, certainly I'm not going to second guess them, and secondly, I mean, because you know, Batman has been a success, and 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 so that's what they felt they wanted to do at the time. Um, I'm able to go back and look at the stuff before that when it was more of a pulp character, and the Joker was a very fearsome uh, villain, and so on and so forth. Um, Jerry Robinson created the Joker, I mm -hmm. should, and Robin, I should mention in passing. Um, but uh, that was the stuff that I liked, and that was the stuff, again, since they moved away from it, nobody had ever gotten back to it. So um, I just found that to be much more interesting to me, and apparently it's, you know, it's interesting to other people too, but I mean, I, I liked that stuff from 1939, 
very much, you know. Sure. No, and again, that was that was the archetype, and that's what everything has been built upon, that foundation. Um, let me ask you about uh, Marshall Rogers, obviously, whose who's art uh, really... You know, it's funny. Obviously, Neil Adams and Denny O'Neill came up with the new look of Batman in the 69 and into the 70s. And then Marshall came along with his version, and it was another innovation. And, and it's, it's interesting because his art has changed again, obviously, yeah. in, in the 30 years since that first story. Yeah, he, I mean, he says that, uh, you know, he was just learning draw in those days. I mean, he and Terry Austin both were young guys who were just getting into the business. They'd done some stuff, mm-hmm. but this was their first major uh, run, and they both, uh, you know, had, didn't have a, they were sort of deciding what they wanted to do as they did it. Um, obviously now 30 years have passed, they've all, you know, they've all done plenty of other stuff, and Marshall now is very much into the bat costume. I mean, he he talks about how when he drew it the first time, he was just trying to make it look cool, but now he's trying to think about how would it actually work, you know, I mean, okay. what what would be... So if you if you look at it, the costume has has undergone some modifications over time. Um, I know Marshall feels that those fins on the bat gloves are not just decoration; they're kind of hard rubber things that you can hit people with. And and sure. uh, you know he's done a lot of thinking about about this costume, which is you know um, you know we're we're all into this thing, and and uh, <laughs> it's nice to have people who are you know to have everybody into it, not just you know one or two, but everybody. And you put the band back together for this project, which is great. Not only Marshall, obviously, but Terry Austin too. Yeah, well, they you know, when they called us, when Joey called us, they called Engelhart and Rogers because that sure. you know people say oh it's the Engelhart Rogers book. Nobody usually mentions the anchor, uh, you know, when they talk about stuff, um, but we did. I mean, as soon as they asked us, we said, well, of course, we want Terry to ink it. And um, there were a number of letterers on the first on the first run, but John Workman had been the first one, and he had sort of designed uh, in captions where the first letter is done in a circle. I mean, that's, again, that's coming out of the, of the early comics, the, sure. that approach. But he was holding up his end of it there by, you know, being into it from the lettering standpoint. So we wanted to get uh, Workman on there as well, and we were told that DC had pretty much given up on live letters. They were all doing it on computer now, but um, we said we'd really like to get Workman, and so Joey went out and made that happen. I think he had to do a little horse trading, but uh, <laughs> but you know, by the end of the day, there you know we had everybody back. Um, not the colorist. Uh, uh, there was no particular colorist on the first one, so we got Chuckery um, this time. But um, at least the you know writer, penciler, anchor, and letterer were the same guys. Well, it's a beautiful production, and uh, as you say, the sixth issue will be coming out uh, Wednesday, and uh, we're taping this obviously before it's released, and I haven't read the sixth issue, but I've enjoyed the first five, and I, I do look forward to the final chapter. Um, I, I should ask you before we move on from Batman, uh, what you've thought of the movie, if you've had a chance to see it. Um, I, like the, I like the movie a lot. I'm, I'm not convinced... Me personally, I'm not convinced that that's Batman. I kept thinking this is a very Batman-like character. <laughs> What's missing? Um, uh, it's not so much missing as I'm not, you know, the the whole thing about um, deciding to study the criminal mind by becoming a criminal and then getting thrown into a Chinese jail where you can beat up large guys on a regular basis, that didn't strike me as uh, anything that I'd ever heard of. I mean, it's not, see, that's the thing. It's not, you could believe it if somebody said that was the story. It doesn't negate anything. Yes. I mean, it, it fits in with the kind of character he became, but it's not, you know, um, I used to write Doctor Strange, and he went to Tibet, <laughs> you know, but I'm not sure that Bruce Wayne ever went to Tibet or wherever the, wherever this thing was. Um, there was that kind of stuff that I kept thinking, this is it's you know it's batman esque but i'm not sure it's batman that said it's extremely you know it's a very entertaining movie it's very well made it's very clever uh, a lot of stuff you know the script was very well written and it was very direct, well directed i I've, I've got nothing bad to say about it i just wasn't convinced that it was specifically the batman okay. but but i had you know again i have my own take on it so sure. and i but i wasn't i must say i wasn't sitting there going well, if it's not my take, it's wrong. It's just uh, I didn't think it was a take. I just it didn't connect with you. That's okay. Right? Yeah. Sure. sure. Um, and we should mention too that uh, for for people who haven't read 
uh, the first part, Dark Detective 1, elements of that ended up being adapted for the animated series. Well, and for the first movie, the you know the one Michael Keaton with um, uh, Kim Basinger yes. as quote Vicky Vale. I mean, she was clearly Silver St. Cloud in that movie, and and um, I mean, I know the history of that thing that that they had tried um, from 1976 to 1986 to adapt that run. I mean, there's a number of scripts by people. It's all got Silver St. Cloud. It's all got Boss Thorne in it. Then when they filmed it, um, they decided that it had been so long since that book that they changed her name to Vicki Vale because it had been, you know, 15 years or whatever, but uh, 13 years. But the first movie is pretty much uh, based on the on the run that we did. And then, yes, the animated series and everything all came out of that, that whole, you know, again, going back to the 40s yes. approach that they had in the animation thing. Um and that, I think, you know, goes back to the early thing, that in the comics, somebody decided that they wanted to take Frank Miller's concept and apply it to the ongoing Batman. Um, but for the world at large, you know, the movie and the, and the animated series obviously was much more visible. And, um, uh, you know, most people, I think, in the world at large who aren't big comic book fans... Um, Still resonate to the you know to the one that Marshall and I did that then had its various permutations afterwards. There you go, Steve Engelhart talking about the Laughing Fish and uh, Dark Detective, Dark Detective Two, and uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I miss Steve in comics. I know he, I think he feels kind of burned by uh, some of the treatment that he got both at Marvel and DC, and uh, I, I don't know if he's even doing um, cons anymore. Man, I got to talk to my con buddies. And see if, uh, you know, what the deal is. And also go check out his website still and, and find out as well. The original conversation that we had, we also talked about his uh, Captain America run, so seminal in the 70s, The Secret Empire. Uh, the original run that led Cap to abandoning for the first time. The Captain America identity, him becoming nomad. Um, uh, the, the government choosing uh, another Captain America. That story happened in the 70s first. It's happened a few times uh, later in the past. John Walker, of course, USA agent, one of the former uh, second-tier Captain Americas that the government chose, a more conservative Captain America than uh, Steve Rogers. Uh, we also talked about his Avengers run. He did a great Justice League run as well. I, I adore Steve Englehart. I may republish uh, that entire interview at some point. But, you know, it's, it was Batman Day, so I, I wanted to... Uh, I thought he's a great representative and also sometimes one of the unsung Batman heroes. My buddy Matt Wagner, who I didn't see in Portland, was hoping to. Another great uh, Batman hero that never gets his due. And uh, another guy that I was hoping to run into, Bob Shrek. But uh, Bob was at uh, PDX instead of Rose City. So I, didn't, I wasn't able to see him as well at uh, Portland and Rose City. Man, Portland, great city. Cannot rave enough about uh, how wonderful it is. The food is terrific. Uh, the the people are great. The nightlife is excellent. Uh, Powell's Bookstore lived up to the hype that uh, people like uh, Bendis and Rucka and Kelly Sue have been raving about Powell's for years. Uh, I spent a lot of great time with Brian. Um, I'll admit we didn't record. We we're like, ah, we'll do it tomorrow. Ah, we'll do it tomorrow. And then it was Sunday night, and I'm waiting for my uh, to my Uber back to the airport. And he's like, we didn't record. I'm like, I know, man, but it's okay. Um, you know, we got to hang out, and that was terrific, and it meant a lot. And again, meeting a lot of Portland listeners was great, too. There is another episode of Word Balloon I'm releasing today. Um, we lost uh, Bill Shelley, the great comic book historian, about a week and a half ago, a couple Thursdays ago. And, um, man, I, I, I adore Bill Shelley's work. He was a very important comic book fan and historian, and um, I had the opportunity to talk to him when he released his uh, biography of Otto Binder, a very seminal Captain Marvel and Superman creator. Uh, funny, I mentioned Bendis, of course. He did a lot of the heavy lifting in terms of creating the Legion of Superheroes. He wrote the original iRobot story that uh, featured uh, the robot Adam Link accused of murder. They remade it into a horrible film with Will Smith in the early 2000s. They remade it into two much better uh, Outer Limits adaptations, one in the original series and also one in the Showtime 90s series that MGM produced. 
in both cases, that original 60s series and 90s series, uh, Leonard Nimoy played a key role in both cases. The first time a young reporter in the 60s version and then uh, played the uh, brilliant attorney that has to, uh, uh, you know, defend this robot in court uh, in the 90s version. And it's actually his son, Adam Nimoy, uh, did the directing. And both are fantastic. Can't recommend them enough. Uh, and again, it all came from uh, Otto Binder and a discussion with Bill Shelley. Uh, we, uh, we lost a really great one. And I'm really glad before he passed away, he gave us one last wonderful history of comics. And that is a great biography of James Warren, the man behind uh, Creepy and Eerie and Warren Publishing and all the other great magazines, black and white comics that he produced from the 60s uh, to the early 80s. Uh, an amazing career and a very interesting one. A guy that was competing as much with Hugh Hefner in terms of magazine publishing as he was with comic book companies. And it's a fascinating story and Bill captured it so well. Um, yeah, we missed a good one, man, when uh, we lost Bill this year and it's pretty tragic. And I want to honor him by uh, representing my conversation with him. So you can hear that as well on the Word Balloon feed. Uh, look for it in a, in a, you know about an hour or two after uh, this episode drops. But thanks a lot for listening to Word Balloon, as always, man. And it really means a lot. Uh, brought to you by Aftershock Comics. Uh, go to their website and you will check out wonderful uh, books. Then you will find a genre that fits your taste. And uh, great creators that have already established themselves not only at Aftershock, but also at other publishers as well. And a lot of my good friends are, are making great books at Aftershock. And you can find one for yourself as well. Uh, go to their website and you'll find full story descriptions, preview pages, and the diamond codes on how to order these books through your local shop at AfterShockComics.com. Also, Word Balloon brought to you by the League of Word Balloon listeners who subscribe via Patreon. I met a lot of you in the last two months at uh, Terrificon in Connecticut on the East Coast and then at Rose City in Portland on the West Coast. Meant a lot, and I got to shake your hand and thank you for it. And I always mean it when I say it, man. If you know I'm going to be at a show, you make sure that you come by and tell me, hey, I like Word Balloon, and thanks a lot. So I can thank you for listening because uh, you're helping me, man. You're, you know you are. You're helping me pay the bills. You're helping me put out great programs here at wordballoon.com. Patreon.com slash wordballoon. That's where you'll find my Patreon page. If you want to subscribe, if you think Word Balloon might be worth a dollar a month to you or the price of a comic book a month, it's greatly appreciated. Anyway, uh, Stumptown, Greg Rucka's uh, wonderful television series, debuts in uh, two days, Wednesday night, as I'm uh, dropping this episode. And uh, we'll be talking to Greg in uh, the weeks ahead about uh, what's going on with him and uh, other great creators that I managed to say hello to. And uh, we'll have to finalize and, uh, you know, get uh, things going with a, with a conversation. But uh, until then, uh, enjoy these uh, episodes from today. More great content. And thank you for being patient. I, uh, I'm back on stronger legs and uh, out of the woods as far as being sick. And I've got great conversations to line up. Uh, we still got a lot of, uh, you know, September to get through, about a third of it, and also, uh, or a quarter of it. Also, um, you know, October already has some great plans as well, and I can't wait to share them with you right here at Word Balloon. Until next time, thanks for listening. Word Balloon is a copyright feature of Shaky Productions, copyright 2019.